Uh, hopefully, you're in, you're in the right talk. Uh, you probably, if you've ever experienced going to like a, uh, a course or a class you didn't want to go to, this class is about uh, modern web testing and uh, basically testing of UI outside of the Selenium, even though we're going to talk about that. In more precise uh, terms, I will be talking going beyond Selenium web driver. But with that, though, I always like to establish the goals of today's presentation, so you can still make a cautious choice whether you want to stay here in this presentation or choose any other great talks that's uh, happening in parallel with mine. So, the first and foremost, we will discuss the choosing the right test context. So you know that if you are working with a web context for the client, for the customer, using JavaScript as a developer, uh, maybe as a tester you also might want to use JavaScript. Or depending on what context you're working in, it might be different. Then we will discuss choosing the right level of testing, when we will use the, something called test pyramid to direct our testing effort. And the last but not least, we will discuss choosing the right end-to-end -end test approach. I feel like I should have talk, called my talk something like choosing right. I don't know, I always like starting, starting like that. So, without further ado, I already kind of mentioned it, but let's go into more details of how we test. And when it comes to the question of how we usually test our software, what comes up is the so-called test pyramid. And I hope you've seen it at some point in your professional career. And so if you've ever seen it on a lower level, you would have the unit tests. And you can see that by the width of this lowest level, it's, you're supposed to have the highest number of this type of tests. When you're not even running your application, it should be as simple of a test as just a single unit of work. It's all the matter of low cost, cost whether it's a writing the test, maintaining. So that's the state that you have to follow. That's the recommendation of keeping it low cost. It, they're usually the fastest in your test um, suite. But unfortunately, they give you only the lowest level of fidelity. The confidence level in your software is not very high if you just stick to this level. Hence, we have to go up the pyramid to the integration level tests, where it might require you running the real app or have some mocking involved, but in this level you actually have multiple units working together and that's what you're testing. And the last point and where we're actually talking about the most today, it's the end-to-end -to -end tests. And those unfortunately the prices to maintain and to write, they are the slowest comparing to the other levels of the test pyramid, but they give you the highest level of fidelity or the confidence level in your software is the highest on this level of the test pyramid. That's why it's very important if you look at the pyramid itself, you're supposed to have the lowest number, the, mini, the minimum number of those tests because they're supposed to replicate what your real customer, your user, uh, interacts with, with the production application. So, that's the test pyramid. <sighs> Unfortunately, when it comes to actually testing the web, or any sort of software, but in particular web, web applications, we encounter something called real test pyramids. And those are not very pyramid-like. Pyramid and so with those test pyramids, you have an ice cone, ice cream cone pattern, you have an hourglass, and a cupcake. It's fairly sweet uh, types of pyramids, I would say. But with that though, if you look at the ice cream cone pattern that we often encounter, and I can unfortunately say that more, most enterprise companies I worked with have this pattern in place, where uh, it's the reverse test pyramid, where you have the fewest number of unit tests, more service tests, which is nice, but unfortunately, you have the highest number of end-to-end -end tests. And if you remember, they are the slowest, they are the priciest, and many companies still rely on manual tester, testers to do a lot of their test automation, or the regression suite testing, after every single change that they make, which does not gonna scale well unless you keep hiring more and more people. So that's pretty common in the enterprise world. The, uh, another example of real test pyramid that's out there in the wild, especially around web, automation is the hourglass. Here, it's often implemented in the teams that try to follow TDD, where they've actually written quite a few unit tests. But unfortunately, that's where their the test-driven development practices ended. So they've written lots of unit tests, service tests, or integration tests, whatever you call, they call them, um, they just gave up on. And they continued the old practice of writing as many end-to-end -end tests as they possibly could. So it's still, not a good approach, but unfortunately it's reality for many. And the last one is so-called a cupcake pattern, where um, you have a much better situation. On the lowest level you have quite a bit of integration tests and unit tests, but there is a lot of duplication with the 
UI test or end-to-end -end test. And as a result, you still have the majority of your tests existing on an end-to-end -end level. And you can possibly have that many real customer scenarios that you have more of those tests comparing to the unit test and integration test. So this is, again, not very scalable approach to go with. So hopefully we kind of agree that that needs to change. And you don't want to go with those real life test pyramids. And you, but if it's a you know ice cone, you want to flip the, the pyramid and maybe reduce the number of manual testers. If it's an ice cone, you want to remove the duplication. So how do we even change that? Uh, first, I'd like to set the context for today's overall talk uh, because we want to be practical, and I would say we need to test some things throughout today's presentation. And that's something I won't be much creative here. I'll show you what we're going to test today. So as anyone else who, who shows you the UI automation or end-to-end -end frameworks, I will go to this todomvc.com. And in here, you can basically select, select any framework of your choosing, making a, performing a simple operation of creating to-do lists, completing the tasks, closing them, deleting them, etc. So one of those examples will be this to-do built on Angular. I personally don't like the lack of contrast here. It being said, it's a simple to-do build on Angular. Let's say I say something like, speak, Mac is, Macs are so fast here. Speak, on ND, speak at NDC, that's my first thing, and then go to pubconf. Pubconf is more important though. Um, and you can easily like, complete the task, you can delete the task. So you can see it's very simplistic app that anyone can uh, implement on any sort of frameworks. People often use it to compare frameworks as well. So that's basically where we, what we're gonna base our, some of our testing today and I'll be giving some examples on. So back to the testing itself, to the presentation. Uh, the case I will be considering first, because as I've said, this to-do MVC has so many different implementations. The first case we'll be looking at is when I have a backend written on Java. If it's these days very popular, like Spring Boot, for example, to make my, to bootstrap my web services and have a backend properly generated. And uh, the, often what people end up doing is they end up writing their tests in Java as well. Um, people often think that there is no problem with that, that you know, your backend is in Java, let's also write our tests in Java if it like, comes to the Selenium web driver. I would say there is a problem with that approach. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if you're moving away, away from this backend testing, um, I always make an argument that it's not the best approach because, because of a thing called hybrid model, uh, domain-driven design, and a user-centric development. Because again, we will be talking about today um, based on the web testing. And if you really come into the web testing, backend testing is not going to fit your infrastructure well enough. And if I talk about the hybrid model and what the heck that thing is, the hybrid model basically has been quite popular in America in the past couple of years. The idea that you don't have uh, any more testers and developers. You call everyone software engineer. And everyone basically is supposed to follow software principles that we all know and love. At the same time, people are supposed to have testing expertise. The problem I often see with this hybrid model is that people actually lack a testing expertise. Everyone knows those patterns, the software patterns, but they just disregard the testing part. But that being said, that's the direction people are moving towards. And because of development, for web these days often happens on the JavaScript side, on the UI side. I would say the backend testing is not the best approach. When it comes to the main driven design, again, the same idea of the ubiquitous language and the fact that context really matters. When it comes to ubiquitous language, what it means is that you try to speak the same language with all your stakeholders in the team. In other words, if you have the main experts, developers, or even testers as a separate role, you want to make sure that when you discuss part of the software, part of the feature that you're going to test or develop or make changes to, you want to name it the same way, whether it's in a verbal discussion, in a written text, or in a code. If I'm as a developer, write my code 100% of the time in JavaScript for the UI, using Node.js or whatever it is, uh, or you know, some of the fancy frameworks like React or Angular, as a tester, I want to write my test so developers don't have to make that context switch and so they can stick to the JavaScript. So I write my test, test in JavaScript as well. And when it comes to the user-centric approach, it's a fairly popular approach and I hope you try to implement it to some extent. 
is to avoid that inverse test pyramid because you're not going to have the highest number of tests written in the end-to-end -end fashion because you can't possibly have that many user scenarios. Hopefully you actually interact with your customers and you know what kind of flows they go through on a daily basis. And if you do that, you can actually implement tests appropriately and keep your test suite to the, uh, you know, sayable numbers. So if you're still not convinced, and I definitely understand that, I actually took me a while to make the change of my mind. When it comes to modern web testing, the thing is, if you're thinking about web as a whole, trying to embrace power of JavaScript, or some people even call it, you know, the language of web these days. Uh, obviously, it's arguable. <laughs> but to that point, the power of JavaScript that I really appreciate personally is that there are so many assertion libraries available to you, especially if you're switching from other languages, if you've written a lot of Java, Java code for your tests. With assertion libraries of any kind, you can easily test your code. There are many process libraries that follow certain methodologies. And uh, Enterprise supports JavaScript quite extensively. To give you an example of a assertion library, there are, quite, there are obviously quite a few, like Chai, Jasmine. For process libraries, let's say for behavior-driven development, there is a Cucumber available. And uh, for the Enterprise support, I don't even have to name that many. Apply Tools is one of the most popular ones for the visual testing um, for the JavaScript. So they have a good bindings for that as well. So, if you really you know, stick to the JavaScript, you're trying to speak the language of the web. And in particular, I'll be talking today about Node.js. Because with Node.js, the cool part about it is that isomorphic, in the sense that you can write both server-side and client-side code using Node.js. It's extremely flexible and extensible and customizable. Thanks to the NPM manager and the NPM packages, you can easily install and have those you know, assertion libraries, enterprise libraries, whatever libraries you might want. Again, if you're coming from a Java, Java you know, background, similar to the import statement and having like libraries in your Maven and Gradle, but here, using NPM managers, you can easily install them as well and just get going in a matter of seconds. But enough of this kind of generic, you know, abstracted conceptual approach. Going back to the pyramid and looking down what is web test pyramid, on the lowest level, again, we still will be sticking to the point of having unit tests and following this pattern of keeping them low cost, high speed, and low fidelity. So when it comes to unit tests, and again, I'm trying to bring you back to this original test pyramid of not having that many UI tests. And that's where I'm saying going beyond Selenium because I personally suffer every time I write, run, run or write Selenium tests. Not because Selenium is bad. It's because I've written so many of them and I can't possibly wait for them to complete as a developer because I need that quick feedback. And when it comes to unit tests, the most important thing as a developer is a quick feedback loop so I can change my code as I go. So, unit test, testing in the web context, there are a variety of ways. Jasmine, to just give you an, an example that you can easily write your unit test in the JavaScript as well. Um, that example, uh, to do MVC app that I've showed you, let's say we created a simple test, create to do item. In this case, this is the actual function in production, as an example. And it gives, takes a user input, it converts it, and returns it in a specific state. Doesn't really matter what it does, I'm just showing you that as simple as it gets. But when it comes to testing that, you define your test suite, you define the test itself, you know, you specify the function, so a bit of somewhat not as verbose as what Java, for example, would be, but still, you have to write some code, especially naming your tests, and hopefully you appreciate the proper naming when it comes to the test suite. And, you know, you basically initialize your test, and you have the same simple assertion. So again, even if you're currently not using JavaScript for your test, the flow is the same. It's, you know, arrange your test scenario, act on it, and then assert it. Nothing different. But here you're really accepting this same context, web context, and going away from just writing web end-to-end -end Selenium tests alone. When it comes to the next level, to the going to the integration tests, with integration tests in the web context in particular, I would say Jest is one of the quite popular these days. Uh, it's an open source library managed quite a bit by Facebook, but again, it's an open source and people can contribute. Um, the way it works, in the, this case, it will be like to do MVC built with React. And React, if you've ever seen it, 
It's just a bunch of components that follow component-driven development practices. But the idea is that you just basically create, generate a virtual DOM by writing DOM within JavaScript. This is very oversimplifying things, but that being said, ultimately generates DOM at the end of the day. In this particular example, though, if I were to write a JS test, it, they're fairly simple as well. There's, there's the same pattern all those tests follow. Okay, it's a kind of a jump, but that being said, the way these tests are written, you initialize or you arrange, you render and you render the component, or in other words, you initialize it. After you initialize it in isolation, you save it as a JSON, or we also would call it a snapshot. What happens here is that it generates a virtual DOM along with a potential CSS that might be targeting this DOM, and uh, you save it, and then you rerun it later on. This the just when it comes to snapshot testing, is perfect if you are writing regression suite for legacy systems. And that's exactly what many people do with Selenium. With Selenium WebDriver, people often simply write regression suites. And that's where Jess can really help you out, because again, it's still extremely fast and very easy to maintain. And what it generates is basically this very simple snapshot, including not just the DOM itself, like a button, in this case it's a button and a label, but also the CSS that was written for this React component. So if you really follow this component-driven development, Jest might be your answer for some of the legacy and the regression suites. And Jest is definitely more than just snapshot testing. There are many functionalities. I highly encourage you to try it out when you have time. So if I were to reflect on those first two steps, the unit test and the integration test, I've kind of mentioned it briefly, but with these first two levels, there is only one focus for, the, for both levels, and it's developers. They're primarily written by developers. In my, in my team, for example, especially because we follow this hybrid model, the way we manage it to make sure we all feel responsible for the quality of our product. When developer completes the story, before we give the, another developer a chance to test our uh, epic more extensively, before we ship the code itself, we also add unit tests and integration tests. Because as a developer, I don't necessarily follow these TDD practices, but I want to be able, as I progress in these first initial steps, I've tested those sanity level uh, cases on my own as a developer, and I got that quick, quick feedback that I really, you know, striving for. And then I give it over to my, uh, another developer who does more extensive QE, potentially end-to-end -end tests, but for that later. So again, it's good for, some tests to have this first two level, this focus on developers, it's great for that. But for end-to-end -end tests, focus on developers is not what you're looking for. As a developer, I rarely run my regression suite while making a change. I only let my continuous integration server do, to do that for me. I would try to spend my time running the tests um, only on the first two levels of the pyramid. Because if you're not making it fast enough, nobody will be waiting for it. You have to make a process of testing easy. The only way to drive adoption of any sort of process or a product, there are actually two ways. One is fear in threatening people. It's how we you know, file taxes, we have to do that. But another good way to drive adoption is to make it easy That's and fast in this case. That's why those two levels is where developers hang out the most. For end-to-end -end tests, it's very different because those are not going to be run by developers on their local machines. So, going to the last level, end-to-end -end testing. The same flows of high cost, low speed, but they give you the highest confidence in end-to-end -end flows that your customer encounters. And here we're shifting focus a little bit. And the way it works is, again, as I've said, the focus before was on developers. Now we're going from developers towards our customers. And that's where, again, you have to remember that this simple point, because there is no way your customer performs that many operations on a daily basis. Some edge cases, possibly. But you don't need to have those edge cases tested and run on a daily basis using your end-to-end -end flows. So really keep that in mind. And again, I know it all sounds great about changing the focus and such, but how do we actually perform that? Because it's easier said than done, right? And when it comes to end-to-end -end task testing or user-centric testing, there are so many names for that. When it comes to user-centric testing, what you're trying to do is to move away from interactions towards tasks. You're not thinking about the um, 
page object models necessary if you've ever written any Selenium code. You probably heard of that pattern. You're trying to go towards so-called a screen type play pattern. The, the difference is fairly simple. Let's, give it a, let's take an example. Um, for, for instance, I'm building the authentication page for my application. And if I were to focus on interaction and page object model, if I were to write a test for the authentication where I try to log in, I would write something like, you know, get element by ID, username form, you know, find button element by ID, dot click send keys. So it's very interaction. You, you, you write your code really like a developer, like a machine. You interacting when you're writing these end-to-end -end tests with a machine. Machine is your main um, colleague in this case, your main uh, peer that you're working with, and that's not you, what you want. Our code that we write is a way to communicate with our colleagues, the real-life colleagues, the developers that are working with you, testers, people from other teams, other stakeholders. I'm not encouraging you to write um, Cucumber for BDD and show it to the business analysts. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if you're writing JavaScript code or Java test, whatever test you write, it has to be abstracted from those complexities and send keys and find elements. Instead, what you do is login form, um, enter username, press login. Simple as that. You write the code the same way you would talk about the process. You abstract that. You focus on the task because the task is what customer interacts with. They don't care about you finding an element, sending keys to that element. It's way too technical. It's so, you're trying to use those tests as a documentation because let's be honest, how many of us write documentation on a daily basis? But how many of us actually write tests? We can be using tests to, uh, in a way to document the functionalities. But back to our application though, and enough talking about that. When it comes to end-to-end -end testing as a whole, the common way to do end-to-end -end testing is of course Selenium WebDriver. And uh, I'm not in any way saying Selenium WebDriver is bad. Selenium WebDriver is great. It's a de facto end-to-end -end tool. It really moved forward our industry. It's a testing standard at this point. If you look at any sort of re job um, requirements these days, especially for the testing professional, the Selenium web driver most likely will be there. It's, uh, but the thing is, it's fairly generic, so it really fits like everyone to some extent. Uh, and it has a high number of different integrations, whether with like your custom use case or enterprise or whatever it might be. So, Selenium web driver as a whole. It, uh, majority of Selenium products, they follow a simple scheme where, then you don't need to look at it too closely, but the idea is that you're really trying to target, you have a bindings to particular browsers, and these days, fortunately, browsers themselves, uh, the companies behind browsers, of course, uh, provide supports and bindings for that. You have the remote control server, it's fairly generic, and bindings for the language that you want to write the code in. As I've said before, many people who have a backend in any shape or form written in Java or C Sharp, they would you know, remain writing web, uh, web tests using Java as well. And as I've said before, I really try to encourage people to write uh, JavaScript code instead. But this is where WebDriver.js comes in. And it's very important, by the way, the capitalization. Uh, GS, that's S is small. If you do uh, both G and S capital, it's a completely different framework. So the, and the Google never updates the search index. But that being said, that's kind of a, a fun aside. WebDriver.js is very similar. It's actually a Selenium product as well. It's, uh, it's a JavaScript bindings. And um, Selenium WebDriver.js follows exactly the same ideas that it's a de facto end-to-end -end tool because it's still Selenium. It's uh, still testing standard. And again, it's very generic and it has high integrations because again, it's just Selenium. The, the pattern-wise, the schema-wise, it looks exactly the same, except the language bindings are with Node.js. So again, here you're able to write your JavaScript code or language, use language of the web for your product, not just on the developer side, but also as a tester. And uh, if you were to write WebDriver.js, again, it's, this, this talk is not an instruction how to write tests. It's more of the idea that I explained to you that all follows the same pattern. You can easily switch from one um, framework of one language to another because they all follow the same pattern. If you arranging the test, acting on it, and asserting. In this case, you arrange your driver, 
and also you have to kill it afterwards. You have to like close a quit driver. Then you write the test itself. In here, you go to the URL. You find the element, whatever in this case you're trying to create, uh, find the to-do name and create a new to-do by entering a brainstorm ideas. So in this, this is actually a very good example of how not to write tests because this one is actually following interaction-based testing. If I were to write the task-driven test, it would be a completely different scenario. I will be abstracting that a lot more. But with that, though, you can still, the reason why I've written it this way is so you can actually connect to the way people would write it in Java, as an example, or C Sharp, or whatever you're currently writing your web driver tests in. But the whole point here is to show that how simple and close it is to whatever people have today. Unfortunately, when it comes to Selenium WebDriver.js, it's not all just the good parts, not that simple. <sighs> yeah. End-to-end -end tests all have a major complexity. And one of those complexities is the finding elements, selectors. Um, the locator strategy, how you even finding those elements in the first place? Uh, what's the kind of test flows? How are you writing your test? Is it parallel? Is it asynchronous? A synchronous? How do you even implement that? And how easy it is to write those tests? Those things are very important. And um, it depends what kind of single page application type you're targeting. In case of WebDriver, it's obviously a generic type. But some of the frameworks we'll look at, they will be more specific to certain frameworks. So, when it comes to WebDriver.js and those four points, in, in terms of selectors, it's again very similar to what people used to on a backend, on a server side, WebDriver testing, where it's all by ID, CSS, XPath, whatever you prefer. Obviously, there are more preferable ways to do that. In, t in terms of a locator strategy, it's fairly simple. It's those by elements, by locators, nothing special here. Uh, for the test flow, for the longest time, there was something called Promise Manager in the Selenium WebDriver.js, which made, the, made you per, to perceive as if you were writing code synchronously. Because one of the most, more com biggest complexities when it comes to writing JavaScript and Node.js would be the handling of asynchronous flows. Fortunately, Promise Manager is not there anymore, so you're just writing your code as if you were to write it from uh, you know, top to bottom, which is great. Uh, so people don't have to make much of readjustment when they're coming from writing the code on a server side, again, using Java or C Sharp, now to the JavaScript side. So there is no you know, learning curve involved in that regard. It really helps with the team transitioning. And as path types, uh, element-wise, as I mentioned, it's very generic. It fits any and all types of single-page applications. Still, it looks quite limited. I mean, it's all great, as I've said, and it's a great start but it's still limited. And if you were to look for something better or better fitting your solution, again, what's important is to acknowledge what kind of case we're working with. Or as any consultant would say, it depends. In this scenario, let's say our to-do MVC was built with Angular. And when it comes to Angular when, and the writing tests in JavaScript, of course, we have to like, acknowledge that in Angular, there are things like models, controllers, components and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to go into too much. But the important thing that bindings that you do for Angular is fairly different from the generic approach that you might follow uh, with the WebDriver.js. So with Angular though, that's why for Angular, let's say we have these examples, models and forms, they're a bit more involving than just uh, writing a simple HTML5 uh, application. So, with this example and just explaining how it looks like, which is not important to this presentation, what's important is next, is how we actually test Angular. And of course, we will be testing unit tests, integration tests, or whatever you call them, service tests. But what interests us the most right now is end-to-end -end tests and how we approach that for Angular app. And for the Angular app, what's important is that we don't just want to use WebDriver.js, because again, it's very generic and limited. Because here we have something new, models, controllers, etc. Uh, so you have to have a new tools and solutions for that. So this is why there is something called Protractor. And it's, some, it's a testing tool that's being created by the Angular team it's, itself, which is a great benefit, and I'll explain you why. So Protractor, again, it's end-to-end -end test framework built specifically for Angular apps. So, Protractor. It's, uh, it's very similar. Uh, to Selenium WebDriver.js, 
mostly because it uses everything WebDriver.js has and just has a shell on top of it with some extensions in terms of how it's written and what kind of bindings it has. It still has the same remote server it uses, Selenium server, but the cool thing is when it comes to the browser or state, uh, app state awareness, because it's written by the Angular team itself, they were able to share some information with the test framework. Um, test framework. In this case, when the app finished loading or when the Angular web app uh, is ready to be tested, which is uh, so important when it comes to end-to-end -end tests. There is a major concern in the UI testing called flaky tests. It's those tests that the primary reasons for um, just um, it's like non-deterministic kind of tests where they would fail, but you don't know why, especially when you try it manually, it just passes. That's why there are so many talks about that topic alone. That's where, and the, one of the main reasons for flaky test is because you have to wait for a certain element to show up or for the web app to finish loading. This is why it's so uh, cr cr crucial to get some insight from the app itself I'm done loading, I'm ready to be tested. And that's the sharing of this information is what we have with Protractor and what you get with it. And uh, if you remember those complexities I've showed with the end-to-end -end tests, selectors, locators, test flows, and spot types, if you were to look at Protractor and how it fits here, selector-wise, uh, we have element bindings. We don't just have you know, the ID, X, uh, you know, the CSS selectors or XPath, which you definitely do have. Because again, you use everything that WebDriver.js has, and then some. In this case, you can actually bind particular models, controllers, and so on. The locator strategy, you can you know, bind repeaters, models, so go beyond outside of just by element. And test flow-wise, as I mentioned before, the coolest part here is that application state aware. We know when the app finished loading, we can start testing whenever it's completed. And the spot types, obviously, it's a pro protractor is for the Angular. It's very Angular oriented. So, a quick, give a quick example again with this to-do um, scenario. Here, it's not any different from other tests, but here you can connect to the models a bit more closely. In that regard, you still get your browser, you get the, and you load your URL, but here you can see that we are requesting by model. We won't be able to do it using Selenium WebDriver JS unless we implement some extensions. But with Protractor, you get it out of the box. And you know you can do by bindings or any special types of uh, elements that Angular has. Protractor will support because again, don't forget, it's even though it's open source, the same team, the Angular team, really works on that quite a bit, and it's actively maintained. If you go to GitHub, you would see that. So Angular is great and all. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because it generates quite a bit of business, there are many UI frameworks out there. It's not just Angular, there is obviously React, Vue, there is Ember, the Backbone, and so many others. I'm not going to try to name them all. I don't think it's even possible. Um, but let's say you want to use Protractor with React, one of the popular ones, right? You can do that. There is no issue with that. Uh, the only thing you have to do is you update the config and you remove like synchronization. The thing here is that it's really useless though, because you can't really do by models, by controllers, bindings properly, and uh, which have to make you think if you commit to Protractor, you have to, it means that you committed to Angular to some extent. That's why it's so important, the same point I've made before, that hybrid model, domain-driven design, that you have to have a very close interaction between different stakeholders. You have to know that your developers are not changing to React of you tomorrow or the next week or the week after uh, when you're just about to implement Protractor and rewrite your whole test automation from Selenium WebDriver to use Protractor. You have to keep up uh, and work together on that. And don't just treat testing as a second-class citizen in your infrastructure. So it's very important to highlight that. In terms of what's next, though, like after all this Selenium-based, because Protractor is Selenium-based, test framework, uh, if you were looked at you know, the progression of testing infrastructure outside of Selenium WebDriver community, you would have a non-Selenium based UI test frameworks. And in that case, I usually bring up only two, but there are so many more. A test cafe is quite a popular one, but even more popular these days and getting a lot more traction, something called Cypress.io. 
There will be a talk on Cypress.io tomorrow. I encourage you to go to that. So, but I'll briefly talk about these two guys. Um, so far we've learned quite a bit though. It's that there are patterns. All those frameworks that I've compared, uh, which weren't that many, but Selenium WebDriver, WebDriver.js, Protractor, they all fa follow certain similarities, certain things we can compare between the frameworks. The same goes for the test cafe and the Cypress.io. In that case, those common patterns I'd like to highlight, and those are the uh, more of a modern things to do with test frameworks, is that how we handle weights, and as I've mentioned, waiting for the element or for the app is one of the most important thing for UI app automation because of those flaky test problem. Parallel execution is essential when it comes to UI tests, especially if you're targeting multiple browsers. Uh, in case of Cypress, it's a bit of a different problem because they don't target multiple browsers yet. They're really Chrome-driven. Uh, that being said, you can still run, for, uh, run your like, multiple tests for a single browser. Many people I've seen, especially startups or smaller companies, they just target a single browser. In this case, like the, the, one of the most popular, Chrome. But if you're working with markets, um, especially like in Asia, in Japan in particular, you have to sometimes really focus on IE. Still, I've used IE9 recently, and uh, it was quite a journey, uh, to say the least. And the rapid test development, how easy it is to write tests, how easy it is to ex execute them. Because I've said before, it's all about the rapid feedback for integration tests and unit tests. But what many companies have been trying to do for developers, because they see the pattern and the trend of developers doing more and more testing, they try to make tests uh, uh, writing tests and running them as easy as possible and even try to make them fast to some extent. And that's where rapid test development being such a big part of it. And the last but not least is a recorder and IDEs that have been developed for a particular framework. Um, so not surprisingly, as we've tried to transition some of the manual testers to be uh, to work a little bit with automation, not to complete, not to remove the manual testers, but really empower them. Hence, recorders have been quite popular, whether it's for mobile develop development, like with Appium, you can do click and replay functionalities. The same goes for these new frameworks. You can you know, click around and replay those operations later on. So when it comes to Test Cafe, let's have a quick look at that. With Test Cafe, looking at these common patterns, it fits exactly what I've just highlighted, those four features. It handles weights fairly well. It's really waiting for element to load before you can proceed. You don't have to do much of the wait for element. Uh, the parallel execution is very well supported by Test Cafe. Uh, the rapid test development, they have their own ID to some extent that I'll show just in a second. And uh, of course, they also support recorder and ID flow. It's more of a drag and drop functionality than anything else. And to just give you an example of how you were to write code for Test Cafe. Um, I don't like the contrast on this, but that being said, the idea, and this, this example is, is taken completely from the Test Cafe website, which I'll link in the slide so you can uh, look at it for yourself. But again, it's fairly simple because they try to make it easier for developers because if you look at some of the trends in the programming languages like even Java, you would see that the uh, stream patterns when you write a stream of code um, being quite popular even in the testing community. So here they try to use this streaming kind of approach where you specif specify a fixture, a uh, page that you're trying to test, then you write your tests on themselves. The same flow where you arrange it, and you can again see this streaming pattern. You know, I have a test case, type text, click, all in one flow. I don't have to manage much of a asynchronous uh, implementation here. And at the end, I just assert that functionality. But again, the same flow of arranging, acting, and asserting. So again, it doesn't look much different from Selenium, JS, or Protractor, but it's quite powerful. It's one of those more modern non-Selenium um, automation frameworks. And when it comes to the recorder IDs, in this scenario, they have their own ID that they implement. And you can easily check it out on a GitHub that I have linked here. But uh, in this case, they uh, basically go through the flow, they, it's this, this scenario, they just record the functionality and they just replay it. Uh, it's nothing special, it's fairly simple, it's really drag and droppable. If your team is very manual tester heavy or that ice cone, this is perfect because you can easily implement those, uh, you know, click and replay 
features in your team and get your team rolling. And then generate the tests themselves and then get them transitioned to write actual code, automation itself. And the testers will feel you know, empo more empowered themselves as well. But when it comes to the Cypress IO, that one, as I've said, getting a lot more traction compared to the test cafe, at least from what I've seen. And the Cypress IO also handles weight quite fairly well, I would say. The parallel execution, as I've said before, unfortunately don't manage uh, testing multiple browsers yet. That being said, you can still run multiple tests at the same time fairly well. The rapid test development is the, at its very core of Cypress development. You can, you can look at, um, go to the talk tomorrow and hear about it in more details. And the recorder ID, to some extent, they also have. If I were to just give you a quick example code-wise, it's nothing special either, where it's, simil it's very similar to how you would write any other tests. Where you visit the URL, you get a certain field. In this case, it's just a login page. You send a uh, text, but this is very, very generic. It can be, and in this case, actually, I even hit the password itself and uh, look it up from the config file so you don't have to expose it on your test, which is obviously going to be frowned upon if you write your passwords themselves in the tests. But again, Cypress is so extensive, it has to have a talk of its own, and they have a, uh, quite a... The, the documentation on Cypress I.O. website is just superb. I haven't seen that good of a documentation in a while. By the way, I have no connection with them. I've been talking to, about them so well lately. <laughs> no connection with them. Uh, and you even interact with cookies. I hear a lot of people complain about working with cookies when it comes to Selenium. Cypress does that as well. Uh, when it comes to ID and support that they have, oh, it's actually loaded. Um, you can easily do it with Cypress as well. They have a pretty good uh, development, uh, rapid test development uh, patterns implemented because you can easily see uh, your test reloads, you. As, you, as you write your tests, it gets reloaded. You can see uh, your actions right there and then. So again, it makes it much easier and comfortable for developers to actually write and run your tests. Because if it's just written uh, today with uh, more complicated frameworks, it will be only run on continuous uh, integration servers. But uh, with all so many tools out there, and again, I've just mentioned very few, it's all about choosing the right tool for the right problem. We don't want to follow this approach where, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You don't want to have that. And that's why it's important to choose a t proper test framework, because there are so many of them. And I just mentioned very few. There is a WebDriver I.O., which is also great. The Nightwatch.js, fairly old test, test framework. WD and the Nemo, and I can't even name all of them. One of the most important things is that you have to avoid tool mix-ups. You don't want to make it complicated to bring new engineers in the team. Not to say that if you test in a complex feature, your test shouldn't be that complex either. And when it comes to having multiple test frameworks, especially for end-to-end -end tests, you're making it overly, you're over-engineering it. You should not be doing that. Because it increases complexity of your test infrastructure. It avoids the main driven design. You're not having ubiquitous language anymore. You can't communicate even within your own team because there is no common language when it comes to the code itself, to frameworks, whatever you have in place. How do you even choose between so many frameworks? One of the most common things people look at is the GitHub stars. I would say that's not definitive. You have to look at NPM downloads, how popular the Node.js package might be, if you're doing that. Uh, external integrations, whether the enterprise or other open source libraries have acknowledged the importance of a framework, so they're building more and more integration for that. And uh, don't just implement something and go with it. Always implement proof of concept. Try it out. See how it works. Show it to your team. Discuss it with your team. Write pros and cons, and only then progress. But more importantly, when it comes to choosing the tool, though, Two things is how flexible it is for your team in your particular use case. And when it comes to flexibility, what you consider is a cost of transition. If you already have all your tests written in WebDriver JS, it might be uh, easier to transition to Protractor. But if you already written everything in Protractor, transitioning back to WebDriver JS or Cypress might be too big of an investment. But if you start from the scratch, Cypress IO looks like an awesome idea. A uh, more realistic situation, I would say, is when you uh, have a legacy system that you've written 
uh, your existing frameworks for, but now you're building a brand new department or a solution or like a small startup within your company, then um, along with maybe a new UI framework, you might want to try a new test automation as well. And because it's all about return of investment, we all love to reinvent the wheel. We are developers. We really enjoy that, I hope. So you really have to control yourself uh, and don't just jump into rewriting everything even though we want to. Because again, it's very important if you're able to cost customize. As I've said before, if you've written your test in Protractor, which is really Angular oriented, but your team is about to switch to React, it might be difficult to update your test to, now, test to support React now, or Vue, or whatever it is. So you have to keep that in mind when you're making the uh, commitment. And uh, you have to keep in mind how easy, to, easy, easy it is to replace your test framework. Because uh, people often, as I've said, treat testing as a second class citizen. And uh, if you have that mindset, people might disregard how easy it might be, or how much effort it could be to replace the software. Uh, test automation. So you have to keep that in mind and really try to raise the awareness and importance of that. But when it comes to the use case, again, it's so important to try it and fit it particular for your use case. You know, it's the same with diets. There are so many uh, diets out there, but, you know, the keto, pop, you know, the, the what about the diets there? Are? I only know keto these days. <laughs> it's so popular, right? But uh, it's not about just following it by the book. It's how you apply it to your use case uh, in terms of diets to your body or your family or whatever it is. Uh, the same goes for the frameworks. Whatever fits your use case is what's important. So the, for the use case, what you have to consider is your team expertise. I've talked a lot about switching to the JavaScript side. But if your developers don't write much JavaScript or your testers, the people who write automation today, ha haven't been working with JavaScript a lot, it might be too expensive to just make a switch right away. Maybe do some courses, invite a code, you know, someone to train your team, do some online courses, or maybe don't do it at all. Maybe it's all just a fab and we'll all go back to Java, which I enjoy. Um, uh, the application framework that you use is also important, because I've said before, with Protractor example, you would only ever consider it if you're having Angular in place. And when it comes to the test infrastructure, are you even able to run those tests using Cypress or Test Cafe, whatever it is, outside of the Selenium? Because it's all being built for Selenium alone. So you have to keep that in mind. And really don't keep it like in a box. Talk to your team, talk to your management, talk to other teams and those who are involved in managing your infrastructure. So with that, I really have just a call for action for all of you is to try to evaluate what you currently have, what's your current arch test architecture is like. Because Developing a proper test infrastructure requires architecturing. I said to even the verb, designing is a, is a better way to put it. It requires designing your test framework. You don't just, uh, you know, put it on and make it work. You have to write it for your particular use case. So evaluate that and see if it has any gaps. If you have no problem and you're not considering any changes in your framework, why would you even bother? Uh, have the main boundaries in a sense that know what domain is that, in, uh, is that uh, you're working in right now. So that idea of domain-driven design, the ubiquitous language, no, be able to communicate with, the, with your developers. Bridge that gap between developers, testers, and other stakeholders. Be able to communicate properly. And again, I'm not talking about this idealistic, behavioral-driven development stuff. I'm talking about the real-life discussions, uh, planning, and so on. Be able to communicate and talk about what's actually in the code and in tests. Um, and try to really unify your test strategy. As I've said before, avoid tool mix-up. If you currently have a tool mix-up, it might be a good idea to merge the whole thing and have a one direction, one vision th throughout your test infrastructure and your team. And more importantly, experiment. The fact that you are in a conference today already shows that you're interested in making something uh, different in your team and the next team you're going to work for or the next company. But really experiment, because our, you know, our work is hopefully not boring and you want, I hope that you will all try out some of these tools or a tools that might fit you most, or you actually will share a tool that you currently use with me or anyone else in this audience. So with that, I really thank you all for your time. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to go to the questions. But before that, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Yes, please. That's a good question. Oh, sorry, I've been too loud. That's a good question. Um, obviously, there are many opinions. The opinion I usually follow is that when it comes to unit tests, ideally, it does not require running the actual application. So it's the whole, po especially with the massive uh, monolithic apps, like the one I'm currently working with, starting that monster and testing it would require time that I don't have. As a developer, I want it quick. So the unit test, I really don't want to have the whole app spin up. That's why, when it comes to unit tests, I test a single unit of work, single functionality. In that case, I've showed this quick example I gave with, uh, with Jasmine. It's a simple function where I mocked all the data, the input. I didn't go like a user through the UI. I just target a single operation. That's a unit test, at least in my perspective. Um, when it comes to integration test or service test, it might require a running app, or in case of Jest, it would be, which is also arguable, it might require a certain part of the app to be up or just to render a real life component, but it would be interaction of multiple parts of the app. For example, it's not just one function in my JavaScript file, it will be the whole JavaScript file to give to the same abstract, to go for the same abstraction or, this, or test a single component rather than just a function, one function in that component. That's where it comes end-to-end -end test because it will be the entire app, which is a collection of components. So you go function, you go component, and then you go like all components here. I, I, again, it's, it's arguable, but I, you know, I don't want to argue on that. But that's the approach I usually follow, follow because it's all about not starting that whole app uh, that will slow me down, or maybe starting a little bit for the integration test because that's, as a developer, the maximum I'll do. I hope I, I, hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Yes, please. It took me a while to make that shift as well. Uh, I would say, it, 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 honestly, I became like a fan of this approach after reading quite a few, few books on the domain-driven design, where, again, especially after this shift, to a hybrid model engineering, where as a developer, I'm supposed to write JavaScript code because that's basically how we, many of us write uh, web apps these days. Including like if I write Node.js, I would be writing both the service side and you know, the front end. So Java might be not even existent there, or it might be, but it will be done by some API team outside of the department I'm working with. If I have to write end-to-end -end tests for the UI, which means that if the UI is written in JavaScript, I will be writing, writing my test in JavaScript as well because I don't want to have a shift, uh, even shift of IDE. Many people use simple things like Sublime or uh, what is it called, a visual code with, from Microsoft. I don't want to spin up my IntelliJ IDE as much love as I have for IntelliJ IDE. I don't want to spin that up because I want to stick to the same context so I can bring up my Sublime to the developer to show the JavaScript code for production, and also my test, and they don't have to have the shift of context. It's very arguable. It takes some adjustment, a team buy-in for sure. Not everyone wants to do that, but um, unless I'm an API team that writes APIs only on the server side for the UI, uh, I would most likely be writing my end-to-end -end test in JavaScript. But if I write, my, I write only APIs for the web, and I just spent all my time on the back end, then I will be writing even end-to-end -end tests on a back end as well, because I don't even touch Selenium or any of those tools. For example, if I write REST APIs using Java alone, I would be using something like REST Assure, right? I wouldn't even, I would be so happy, because I don't have to ever run Selenium or any of those end-to-end -end automation tools for UI, but they have a different concerns on their own at, uh, completely. But if I write UI a lot with JavaScript, I want to stick to the same context, so there is no shift. Because when the shift of context happens, we lose time, valuable time. But it's arguable. If people have expertise, they might try it out. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, though. Thank you. Any other questions? Please feel free to ask me any questions on any of these sources or approach me right after.
or in the PubConf right up to the today's talks. It's in Amsterdam bar. So I hope to see you all there. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much.